lost my voice earlier in the week. So I'll try to project. Our microphone isn't working, but if you can't hear me, raise your hand and let me know. So I'll speak up. Anybody that wants to speak up closer? Uh, I might lose my voice before the end of this talk, so if I do, we'll just have to point. <laughs> okay, uh, I uh, want to start off by saying I, I, I'm not a Hamilton military weapons expert. I would never say that because every day I find something new about it, which like, my definition of an expert, they know everything, I don't know everything. Uh, but I, I have a passion for it, and uh, the passion came from my grandfather, he was a watchmaker in Illinois, and uh, he, uh, he gave me some of his watches and some of his tools and some of his workbench, everything that he had, all his books. So some of the things that I should have shown today and some of the things on the screen are from him. So when your grandfather gives you something and says, this is, this is exciting, this is important, if you're old enough to hear that message, it sticks. So that's what this is all about. Um, my feelings are that you can start on any hobby and you can start small and then start learning about it and then get bigger and bigger and bigger. So there's almost no end. I, I, every day I still learn about Hamilton Military Water. So I'm going to give you guys what I know about this topic as of today, but I'm sure you're going to learn some more. Uh, I would like to... <laughs> Today's uh, Cinco de Mayo. I'm not Mexican, but I want to introduce my family. My sons are Anthony and Nicholas, and my wife is Tammy, so they wanted to be here, but sleep was better than watching a boring watching presentation. So my wife said, if you go on without me, and the boys were busy with their uh, Nintendos, but uh, anyway, they're here in spirit. And on the, the last time I gave this talk, I, I gave this talk at the Pacific Northwest Regional in Kent, Washington, and uh, last year on April Fool's Day. And I gave a practice for this talk last year on Groundhog's Day, so it seems like I have to do this talk on the holidays only. So um, I thought I'd put a joke up. I'd like to start talking about some kind of uh, joke. The uh, Americans, what they think Cinco de Mayo is actually the real Cinco de Mayo is the 25% of the uh, my son was telling me yesterday when we went to that uh, restaurant, Beanie's restaurant in Port Washington, where those photos were taken. He said, Dad, it's not single tomorrow, it's May the 4th, which is Star Wars Day. He said, Dad, that's a lot of day. <laughs> May the 4th, anyway. And since we're uh, here at our virology meeting, I thought I would tie it into clocks and watches so we can actually go on eBay and buy a single tomorrow clock. Anyway, that's not why we're here. We're talking about Hamilton military one. Uh, so here's the agenda. So I, I thought for those of you who are maybe maybe focused more on clocks or uh, maybe don't really know much about the history of Hamilton Watch Company, I, I'll talk a little bit about the early history of it, and then we'll get right into the military timepiece from World War One, World War Two. Uh, that big box on the corner of the table there. My uh, Friday Joy I bought last year, model 21 Hamilton Commander, so I'm going to talk a bit about that. And then, of course, uh, questions. If anybody has any questions, just raise your hand, interrupt me, whatever. And I'm not going to cover uh, military wristwatches, because that's a whole other area I'm just starting to get to. And uh, post World War II watches like Vietnam or Korean War, those kind of things. I don't have much knowledge about that. I feel very to try to talk about it. So. Uh, let's go right on into the history of Hamilton Watch Company. So, from what I can piece together, Hamilton had a rough start. They started out with, uh, it looks like, at least five different companies before they became Hamilton Watch Company. Each of these companies was essentially put together with some money, raise capital, make some watches, fail. Uh, somebody buys the assets, uh, changes the name, makes some watches, fail. Et cetera, et cetera, until we get to Keystone Standard Watch Company, which lasted a good six years. So you'll see a few of those watches around. They, some of those have interesting hands. It looks like, a, I don't know how to describe it. It's got an interesting shaped hands, uh, which are kind of rare. Then come along to 1892, and uh, the Keystone Watch Company assets and the Aurora, Illinois Watch Company assets were combined. So, since I'm from Illinois originally, even though my wife is from Cedarburg, uh, my, my roots are in Illinois, so anything related to Illinois Watch Company or Illinois uh, companies in general, I, so I, I like to think of Illinois roots, uh, even though it's just, it's mostly uh, it's the Pennsylvania Watch Company. Uh, so, some people might be interested in this.
this is what I understand about where the name Hamilton came from. It was named after uh, Andrew Hamilton, who owned the land which the uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania watch factory was built on. Andrew Hamilton was granted the land by he was uh, by William Penn's heir. So it goes back that area goes back all the way to the game of country. So that's where Hamilton watch company came from. It wasn't named after one of the original uh, watch company uh, executives or anything like that. And that's a picture of Hamilton Watch Company, and you could probably transpose put Elgin Watch Company or a lot of those early, uh, you know, earlier in the 20th century watch companies. They made these magnificent buildings. They had two or three thousand, four thousand people working in them. And it's the golden era of American manufacturing. Everybody had a job, and, and just I kind of miss that. That whole that makes me nostalgic for that. You know, I work in a pharmaceutical business, and. Most of those jobs are going overseas too, so you could probably pick any industry in Wisconsin. A lot of it's going overseas, and we don't make uh, American pocket watches in America anymore. So uh, this is kind of a basically everything here is old news. So Hamilton is uh, why did they survive when all those other precursors to Hamilton failed and went into receivership? And I think it's because it was a it was a uh, combination of effects. The other companies, they underestimate how much money it was going to cost to make pocket watches. And the case and the dials, the movements, the screws, the machines, all that together, they never they never could estimate properly how much capital they needed, so they would always go bankrupt. And then there was this Ohio train wreck of 1891, which precipitated a lot of the uh, railroad standards uh, and testing. So you see at the bottom, uh, Hamilton's made their model the railroad timekeeper of America. So they, they tied themselves to the railroad standards and the high quality watches. And they partnered up with uh, Ball to make you know, Hamilton Ball watches. And so that that kept them around where other companies failed. And their, their emphasis was on you know, making very high quality watches. So anybody who's working on pocket watches will know it's a big part of the watch. It's very nice to work with. So that's kind of some early history. Um, just a flavor of the background. Uh, some early Hamilton milestones. The first watch they made, an 18 size watch. There's a picture of it right there of Hamilton serial number one and number two, and I think those are in the NAWCC Museum in Columbia, Pennsylvania. Uh, they got into 16 size watches not too far after that, and then you know, around World War One they started making wristwatch size movements. And uh, Tying into military watches, they made their, thir their 36 size chronometer watch in 1918. So we'll get into uh, World War One next, but this got kind of some milestones. I, uh, I'm not sure what if those watches would ever come into light, like, how much they would be worth. I guess they were worth a lot. I know they were worth sold. Okay, so World War One time pieces. <coughs> there isn't a whole lot of story here. Uh, I have a few slides, a few different examples. One of them is a, a Hamilton grade 974, which is a 17 year watch. You don't see uh, any markings on them except for on the back of the case. So if somebody in the Navy needed a, a watch at that time, and uh, they, they inscribed it with this U.S. Navy symbol. They took them to the Navy shipping group, and they look like uh, standard Hamilton 974 watches, so nothing real special here. Uh, just a 17. But you'll see these occasionally, and uh, I've seen enough of them to realize it's not just a marriage to put together a watch. Uh, not much there. The one I really get excited about is uh, it's Hamilton 992. Right, 992 was made in you know, large numbers for a long time. However, there was a thousand of these that were made for uh, World War One, and they're numbered on the dial one through a thousand. You can see, I don't know if you can see that as well, or I'll show you. The it says on the dial, Engineer Corps USA, and it has a number one through a thousand. These were used to, to uh, operate the railroad in France. Uh, it was used to supply Pershing's army. The, the U.S. built a 60, uh, 60 centimeter wide narrow gauge railway in France, and they ran the railroad like they did in the U.S. And so they needed watches to time the movements of the trains. There's a better picture of what it looks like. <coughs> 
So here's an interesting story about this kind of watch. When I uh, gave this talk last year, I didn't have one of these. I just did research on it. So then I bought one. This one. It's number 469. There's nothing special about the movement other than it's in the right serial number range. But when I was doing my, my uh, research on this, I found, I, I started looking for how many examples I could find. And uh, this number's grown since a year ago, but I found 36. At the time, I found about 30 out of 1,000, which is about 3%. And so, you know, that's a pretty rare watch. And I thought, well, I'm going to buy one. So I bought this guy right here. For the, I bought this guy right here. For the $700 range, 750 I think, something like that. Then I posted this online, the serial number database, and now there's one on eBay referencing the serial number database for $2,499, saying these are ultra rare. So here's my advice. Do the research, buy the watch before you post the data online. Because <laughs> the serial number, is this a standard Hamilton? Yeah, these are hand standard. As movement serial numbers are listed here. They go, uh, you'll see a few that are in the two million range, but I think there is somebody who put the uh, Hamilton, uh, Engineer Four Dial on another 992 movement. But uh, if you look at these, there's enough examples in the 1.2 to 1.3 million serial number range that you can try to sort out which ones are real and which ones aren't. Um, there, there's a, an article uh, in the uh, bulletin here from June of 2000, or it used to be called the bulletin, uh, it talks about these. I think every year we get a nice job on that one. So that's, uh, that's the only the watch that I found out uh, online this uh, records department order. These, never mind 750 of these were $22 back in the day. So they're, they're a pretty good deal compared to today's price. They ordered them, a uh, thousand of them, and they delivered them all between July and August of 1918. And uh, I have an ad, which I actually have the original ad over there. I bought recently um, National Geographic. Uh, it kind of advertises these watches, although the ad doesn't actually have the engineer or dial movement. It just has a picture of a hand with a 92, but it talks about that the, arm, uh, the U.S. bought uh, watches for riding the railroads in France. So what, this is one of the things I wanted to highlight with Hamilton military watches. They're not just neat instruments of time. They're also connected to history. You know, almost every instance you can start digging and find something very interesting about them. Back to some kind of war or some kind of battle or whatever shit that, that makes it really rich in terms of studying and learning about them. Uh, so moving to my, my uh, next thing I think is a yeah, 36 size torpedo boat watch. This is a this is what got me started. My grandfather gave me two of these giant watches. They're, they're this big. I'll, I'll show you. So it looks like a These were used uh, in World War One and later. Um, and they're, they're a wind indicator. They have a wind indicator dial on them. And they have a, a sterling silver case crescent. And they have a 21 joule movement. It's basically a giant version of the 992. It looks like the scale, like the so magically scale up a handle of the 992. So very similar in the Damascini and everything. But they're rare. There are only 970 of these produced. So I didn't know that when Grandpa, Grandpa gave me two of them and said, don't sell these ever. <laughs> I took his advice. I actually sent them to Ed Udral and he fixed them for me right after Hurricane Katrina. Now they're working, but what I, what I found at the time is the wind indicator parts are uh, not very, really well made. So a lot of them have the wind indicator dial as uh, is, uh, plugged and the wind indicator parts are missing. And if you uh, study, study some of the uh, online articles, Mark Whitney would say when they brought those in, they would repair them and they would uh, pull the wind indicator parts from three or four watches and get them running. So I'm very lucky to find two that actually have uh, that, that piece of the uh, watch working. I had one other one that wasn't working, and the dial was kind of played over the wind indicator dial. So you'll see them both ways. Uh, they are also sold as gimbal watches uh, through the 1940s. So my understanding is you see some advertising, you'll see them in the 1940s. So I think the early, earlier ones were in the sterling silver cases, and the later ones I think were sold to people with yachts or whatever they needed to do for you know, navigation, so they sold them uh, to, to the retail markets. So this is a better, better picture of it. 
lot of times you see the dials are refinished. Um, I think you know there's only 970 of them, so and some of them faded and they got them refinished. Um, I, I, I took my largest 18 size clock watch, which is a Nogen in a six ounce silver case, point silver case, and I took a picture next to one of these 36 size watches. So just to give you an idea, that that Nogen is heavy on the pocket. It'll make your pant leg droop. Uh, so that's uh, it still doesn't compare to this uh, 36 size watch. So they're pretty cool, pretty cool. Um, and this is an example of a 1940 advertisement. Temporary shortage of great 974, right? so that they might have been using some of uh, the 974s for the war, for getting ready for the war at that time. Uh, anyway, they have the gimbals, and then this is uh, the database that I, uh, I put together on 36 sites. So 27 out of 970, roughly 3%. Again, effect, compared to the 992 Engineer Corps, about 3 3 percent so not too many around. So everybody knows a bit more these are grab the uh, information for the database. Uh, the secret's out on these, though. They already go for three to four thousand dollars on these uh, some of these auctions, so I kind of got lucky with getting them for free. Uh, you'll see the gimbal ones that I found online are uh, all higher, all, all higher scale than this probably post-1926 retail market. Uh, what else can I say about those? That's it about the 36 size. Um, between World War One and World War Two, there's some stuff going on in Hamilton that uh, led up to some neat stuff. So uh, one thing that, like I said before, Hamilton bought not only really started from Aurora watch company, but actually purchased Illinois watch company. Most of you probably know that. Uh, but one way to tell an Illinois watch company movement if it's pre or post Hamilton era was after the Hamilton bottleneck, the movement marked Illinois watch instead of Illinois watch. Code. I don't know if that's a 100% exact rule, but that's what I found. I think that's a pretty generally accepted rule. Um, so that, that ties Hamilton even more to my roots, which I, I kind of uh, am excited about. And then they also bought power and watch company naming rights so they, in 1931. Um, and then in 1930s, the, the key thing, they had a whole physics department, and they did a lot of research into alloys. Uh, and they, they actually came up with uh, Eleanor and Eleanor Extra. They, 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 brought those into play uh, right before World War II and that helped a lot of the, uh, a lot of the issues with middle temperature error. And uh, I'll show you what that means in a second, but uh, also they converted the factory over to mainly uh, wartime use. So they weren't making watches for the retail market, or at least not very many. Uh, I think a lot of the factories in North America were doing the same thing. So it's not a um, what is the middle temperature error? Uh, I just pulled this off of a Hamilton Technical Bulletin on Helen Bar Extra. And what it looks like to me is when you have a bimetallic uh, hair, uh, hair spring, uh, I mean, uh, bimetallic balance wheel, so brass and steel expand at different rates. They, they, uh, they expand with different, uh, increasing temperatures, uh, makes the, the watch go uh, faster. But also coupled with uh, the main spring elasticity. Steel, uh, uh, steel hairspring, I'm sorry, that elasticity goes down. So they kind of cancel each other out, but not exactly quite. And so there's this little air that you can see here. It's about one second a day. That's this middle temperature here. So in general, they, you know, for most everyday use, that's fine. But for navigation or for precision, it's, it's not. So that LMR extra gets rid of that because you don't have the bimetallic. If somebody else has a better explanation of that, feel free, because I, like I said, I'm not an expert. I just try to learn as much as I can. So let's talk about, that gets us sort of into the World War II time frame, which is where a lot of the watches I have over here on display are from. Um, 992B is, almost everybody knows about Hamilton 992B. Uh, they made this, uh, lots of them just for the uh, war, because they came out around the same time as the war started. And, uh, they have usually serial numbers for, the, for these pocket watches for the war were C100. Couple. So if you see early Hamilton's uh, 992 serial numbers, uh, in a lot of cases you'll see they're, they're lower than that. For the war, they're less than 100,000. 
And then they also uh, have markings on the, do uh, on the movement that are uh, either U.S. government or U.S. Army or sometimes Bureau of Aeronautics U.S. Navy. So that's another way to spell that they're Hamilton military behind that two weeks, not standard one. And uh, usually they come in a base metal case that looks with that sort of trapezoid bow. So I put together some photos and from some watches I have uh, the different markings so you can kind of tell where the markings are at. And yeah, some of them are on the, uh, on the train bridge and some are on the barrel bridge. So the earliest ones are in the U.S. Army and the Imperial of Aeronautics, U.S. Navy, usually, and the U.S. government are the later ones. Uh, so how do you tell if you have a military 992? I put together some, some key features. Usually they have a gold center wheel, which almost, I think all the early 992 bees had a gold center wheel when they switched to brass. And I'm not sure if it's gold plated or gold, but they can tell it looks different than the other trade wheels. Uh, they usually have the markings, like I told you, and the early serial number, like I, like I said, less than 100,000. Uh, from the front, you can usually have a, uh, most of them have blue hands, and, and I, I, although I don't think that's 100% hard and fast rule because they may have a switch hand, use early hand on the time during the war. And then uh, a lot of times you'll find these with a single sun dial. So if you see a watch that looks like that, chances are it's a 992B. But not, uh, but not necessarily always. Now this one here is an example of not necessarily always. I bought this one recently on eBay and I wasn't sure if it was fake. I wanted to buy it right away as soon as I saw it because it looked real. But I had to kind of get confirmation from other people that it was a real Hamilton dial, which says Bureau of Aeronautics U.S. Navy on the dial and on the movement and on the piece. And uh, it turns out it is a real one, just not very, not very common. So. That's why I said about it. I learn something new every day on this on this topic, and you think you know everything, but you don't. So, in this case, uh, I decided to add to my collection, and then I, this is another one I added recently that I didn't have, which has the U.S. Army markings on it. That one is, uh, I believe, serial number twelve C twelve thousand, and this one is serial number uh, C seven thousand. So, I said earlier serial numbers will be the military. So that's Hamilton nine nine two B. Another cousin of the 992B is a 2974B, which is a 17 jewel watch. So they call that a comparing watch. And again, it has uh, LMR extra. The same thing as the 992B. These have interchangeable parts. So if you look at the, the, the let's say the balance bridge, it won't have a serial number on the back of it like older watches would. Because in theory, you could just swap the balance bridge from any Hamilton 2974B, 992B, 4992B. And the watch will work. Uh, so that's kind of that math produced uh, philosophy. And so I'll show you one in a minute that doesn't have a serial number on it, which is kind of interesting because I, 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 there's no serial number anywhere on any plates, which makes it hard to figure out. Uh, but this one has a neat feature when you pull up on, uh, on the crown, it stops the balance wheel. So you can set the watch to the exact seconds. So the second hand stops when you're trying to compare it to, say, the model 21 chronometer or whatever. Ship and you wanted to set your watch and you could hack it. And it has a really sophisticated uh, mechanism. It's a little lever that just touches the balance wheel. Uh, so it works. It works. Um, and these will have U.S. government on the movement and various uh, ordnance markings on the cases. And a lot of times you'll see them with uh, baton hands uh, and just kind of a dial. But not always, uh, like I said. Uh, and the serial numbers, sometimes you'll see them with. Uh, Starting with K and sometimes with 2K. So uh, there's two different ranges. And these are some examples of some of the ordnance markings on the back of some of the watches they found. They also have a, uh, a cuvette that uh, you really can't get out with your fingernail. Uh, so if you see a case like that, that should be a 2 case. Just kind of giving you guys some, if you see these things, and you'll know that's a 2974 for me instead of a they all have, all these have base metal cases with some kind of nice finish. So this is the one I was telling you about before. Uh, there's no serial number where it should be. It should be in this little slot right here between the bridges. So I took the watch apart and I used to think of a power loop as I could find and there's no indication that the serial number was removed. I mean, you can see the original brush lines from the machining 
and uh, it doesn't have the U.S. government markings on it, and it doesn't have a pack spring like I, I said all the other ones do that makes them happy. Um, but I, I think the, the clue here is that this one is from the U.S. Naval Ordnance Testing Station in California. There's a sticker on the side of the back. So my guess is that this was sent from the Hamilton factory to, to be used for testing out ordnance, blowing up bombs, essentially. Uh, and somehow or another, my grandfather got it, and I got it. But it's been having me scratch my head for the longest while. So I thought, well, I'll just take it apart and I'll look at the bridges. And I, that's where I figured out that these watches don't have any serial numbers on the backs of the bridges. They're, they're interchangeable copies. And so I think that's kind of a neat one. And uh, it's also neat that I can put it back together without breaking it. <laughs> uh, speak, another uh, in the family of these B watches is a 4992B. And uh, this one's basically a 22 22 joule version of the 992B, and the big difference is it has a 24 hour dial. This is really fun to take to work and show people they, what time do you think it is. And they look at it, and they don't look at the number, they just like I said, it's, it's not the right time. And I said, yes, it is. It's, it's just that you're using a 12 hour dial, and this is a 24 hour dial. So, not very popular for people who aren't in the military. <coughs> so, uh, because of that, a lot of these watches were converted after the war to 12 hour dials. These again have the same kind of markings as the uh, 992Bs, the U.S. government, Bureau of Air U.S. Navy, U.S. Army, Air Corps, etc. And they have uh, they have generally base metal cases with ordnance markings on the back. Although there's some that have 80% uh, silver cases, and you'll see these occasionally in some of the marks. Uh, and uh, those go for a little bit more money. And it has a 24-hour dial with black hands. They made quite a few of these. It must have been a workhorse in the war, 120,000 for the war efforts. But for World War II, about 100,000 or so. And uh, over <coughs> for the Army, some for the Navy. So those of you who were in, the, in that war or in the Army or Navy at that time, you know, I salute you. This, uh, this, is, uh, this to me is what brings it home because my, my grandfather on my mom's side was in the, in, in the Army. And uh, my other grandfather wasn't. But, so I love that, that connection to history. Uh, these, these watches have the 4C serial number, and most of those are up to like 100 or 120,000, but you'll see some that are on the upper end of the range that are uh, 4C serial numbers, but they're uh, 992B. <coughs> so those are not really related to the military. I think those are leftover plates that are used to make, uh, at the end of the factory run in Hamilton. So you'll see those. 92B go for some premium too, but I don't have one of those. So here's some of the markings that you'll see. I don't have, I, I only have the US government or the none, so I'm on the hunt for the other ones, which is why this makes it a fun hobby. Uh, the US Army Air Corps on the train bridge would be a neat one to have. I've done that for a lot. And the Air of Aeronautics, US Navy, uh, that's the same as my, my 992B, but I'm looking for this example of a 492B or none. They didn't have any uh, U.S. government markings. And that's what the dial looks like. Since I just moved here from Canada last year, I have probably uh, more than 24-hour 20, uh, 20 dials uh, for pocket watches. I, I, I kind of collected them when I was up there. But up there, no big deal. Everybody's got a you know 24-hour Hamilton dial, but down here, not, they're not as, not as common. So I snatched as many as I could. And, uh, the ones I'm talking about have 24 hour inner, uh, you know, inside 13 through 24. This is a true 24 hour dial. And that's what the movement looks like. It has this extra wheel here. I think for the, uh, that's what makes it a 22 joule watch instead of 21 joule. Um, so, some things that go along. So, if you collect Hamilton military watches, you have to collect gadgets and gizmos and boxes and everything you can and advertising. So I have one of these that has the uh, original box outside. Well, this is an original box. And then they also came with these metal canisters. I think that was to prevent a uh, magnetic field, either in an airplane or in a submarine or ship to, from interfering with the timekeeping. So they have these, they have these metal canisters with a, uh, a little lid that swings away so you can see the, uh, you can see it inside without opening it up, a little plastic. 
the interesting thing about this one is, uh, yeah, this one's from this box, carrying case navigational from Tecumseh, Michigan. So I have, I have one of those. And then they, uh, they had the official uh, rubber cushion sheath, and then there's this leather lanyard that came with it, so you can, you can find those. Those go for a couple hundred bucks now. So yeah, everything goes together. And then this is the box uh, that I was telling you for the, uh, the carrying case box. So these uh, boxes add a lot of value to the Hamilton 499GB. They go from, I'd say, 400 to 700 bucks. You can add this metal box, it can go up to 1,000 or 1,200. So it's nice to have the whole package. All right, so what else in World War II? One of my favorites is the Hamilton 399GB, which I didn't know much about until I moved to Canada. But essentially, these are 12 hour versions of the 499 TV, so they're made for the British Navy and the Canadian Navy in World War II. And they have a three seat serial number, so if you see you want a three seat serial number, you'll, and, and a 399 TV on the movement. So the one at the top is uh, has a broad arrow on the dial that's, I think, made for the British you know, uh, Royal Navy. And this one at the bottom is uh, the Canadian version. It has a 20, the 24 hour dial, like I was telling you there. Uh, everybody has one you know, up in Canada, but around here. And uh, one way to tell the two, usually the Canadian ones have an 80% silver uh, case. So I have an example for you to look at in, in a box from the Esquimalt uh, Naval Base right off the coast of BC, the about third, third owner, I guess. And they had a uh, surplus military sale in the 70s. Some guys just went and bought them. And then I bought it from the guy who bought it from him. So. Uh, the price has gone up much since then. Um, whatever you look up in the book for Hamilton 399 TV, if you have that big fat book, double the price usually. It usually goes twice as much as what the book is, because they don't sell very often, so the book doesn't get updated very often. So you can chase these pretty high. Uh, it's the two to three thousand dollar range. So here's the one with the with the wooden box, um, and uh, the box has on the outside return to a squire malt uh, uh, chronometer. And you'll see on the movement, it has U.S. government. It doesn't say Canadian uh, government, it's U.S. government. And there's a 399 GB. And then uh, this one is marked on the movement, uh, U.S. Navy Bureau of Ships. And it's, but it has a broad arrow here on, on the bottom right. Uh, and it's broad arrow. So this one would be for the British Navy. Uh, or all Navy. Uh, and this one has blue screws on the winding wheel. So uh, then you'll see these other ones that are kind of interesting. They're called the NATO dial 3992B2. Uh, you might have recognized that it has a black small hand for the hour, then it has a red hand for the minutes, and it has uh, 100 increments for the seconds. So I found on the NAWCC website uh, a letter that somebody said, oh, these are from the 70s. And so they took the British uh, Admiral, Admiralty uh, 3992Bs and then they put this new dial on there, and you'll see, if, if you can see, there's a, there's actually screwed on dials, there's a screw right here and a screw right there, so you might think that makes it look fake, but that's the real one. And they were using it for work studies for timing shipyard workers or something like that in the study, so the more appropriate name is a work study dial. And the only reason it's called a NATO dial is because it has a NATO part number assigned to it at the bottom of the page here. So, so again, you just start learning about the history and it starts you start, you know, going down these, these paths and it's fascinating. So this would have been after Hamilton left Lancaster in 69 so, so who made it? They just took the one left over from, that they had and they just converted them to this dial. Right now. This is okay, so it's still a Hamilton movement? Yeah, it's still a Hamilton movement. I think these are made, I didn't say when they were made till, but from World War II, probably up to the 50s, so they had probably got surplus. Navy yards and stuff made a lot of surplus uh, movements and whatnot in the cases and they put this new dial on the hands. So it's kind of neat. Because it got, got confusing to me because when you hear about NATO dial, these watches are made for World War II and NATO was after World War II, so what's the deal? But no, I'm kind of, I, I was happy to be able to dig into our NOC website and have to find, uh, I put the record at the bottom. Um, most of the things I'm finding are from eBay, or, you know, a lot of the pictures are from my own collection or from other online sites. But this one, I don't want to forget where I got it from because it takes a while to dig and find. Uh, another one that I would have on my wish list. Seven nine nine two B. This is 
large side, 37 size, 24 hour dial. I don't know much about these other than only about 200 flame remains. So I have never seen one on sale. But if I do, I hope I have money in the bank or try to pay my income tax refund or something like that. Or my wife's happy that day or something. <laughs> Um, so not much to say about that other than this, uh, there's a, a bit of information in uh, Marvin Whitney's book on military watches. So. Um, another one that is one of my favorite watches from Hamilton is the Model 23 Navigational Stopwatch. These guys are like a regular pocket watch with a black dial and a 12 hour dial. Uh, they're a 19 joule movement, but they also have a, a, a stopwatch mechanism built on top of the movement. So very complicated movements. In fact, I inherited one of these in a plastic baggie all taken apart. And it still is in the plastic baggie all taken apart. It's, it's way too complicated for me. Um, these are made uh, in the 40s and 50s. They have a P serial number. So P something something. something. And uh, they have a sweep second and an auxiliary, auxiliary, auxiliary dial for keeping track of the minutes on your stopwatch. And they have uh, nickel silver base metal cases that are uh, with ordnance markings. So that's a picture of the movement. So some of you in this room are skilled enough to be able to handle that, not me. That's over my head. Um, I'm sure if you're uh, ambitious, uh, I just, I'm going to leave that one in the back for now. And uh, again, if you're into this kind of stuff, the regional boxes kind of fun to collect uh, that match the movements and case serial numbers. And then the advertising is also neat to collect. So you you can get this stuff for fairly inexpensively, original advertising from all the way back to World War One, World War II. This one shows a guy, he's looking for a U-boat in the sky. And uh, I'm not sure what he's doing actually. Uh, it looks like he's taking a marking until he's navigating, but if he's looking for a U-boat, you think he'd be looking down instead of at, at, through this either sextant or octant, I'm not sure what he has. And for those of you in the military, he probably just looks, you can tell exactly what he's doing, but it's more of an advertising piece to show hey, we're not making any watches for you guys right now, but we're, we're using them in the war. It's, as soon as we're done, we're going to make some for you. And be patient. Uh, so, and buy U.S. war bonds. You know, so it's a pretty cl classic piece of World War II. Isn't that a bomber canopy? Yeah, it looks like a bomber. He's, he's, maybe he's taking a marking of something. I don't know what he's doing. It could be a slave. This is not even a photograph, it's just a, it's a drawing, you can tell, it's, 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 just, it's like an ad agency. But he's got some kind of, I mean, he's looking up, I think he's taking a reading to figure out what's going on, but I don't know. Anyway, he's, he's saving, the, saving us from the Nazis and the Eagles. So, uh, that's it for the Model 23. There's another one that, uh, that I inherited, well, I inherited this one too, lucky me. Uh, it's a Model 22 chronometer. World War II, it's a uh, 35 size. So again, it, it's something that wouldn't box. It's another ginormous one. Uh, I almost made the mistake of selling this right after I got it because I thought, oh, I can get a lot of money for that. But I kept it. And um, I'm glad I did because it's pretty cool. Because uh, it has the original outer cardboard box that came with it. Um, there's about 10,000 of these made for World War II. So think about in World War II, uh, all this. Prior to World War II, probably almost all the chronometers were made in Switzerland or Germany or England, and that supply line was pretty much cut off. So the U.S. had to come up with a way to navigate thousands of ships, and they needed thousands and thousands of these chronometers. So Hamilton stepped up to the plate and made these uh, and uh, supplied the U.S. Uh, forces. Um, some of them were produced in those uh, giant sort of pocket watch looking thing, uh, and then another. A bunch of them are made in gimbals, regional ships. There's a picture of uh, one in a gimbal. I'm on for one of those, but I haven't found one I, I could have, well, at the time, could afford. Um, they're not that expensive, but you have to have money for some of these things. And that's what the movement looks like. This one says U.S. Navy Bureau of Ships, 1943. Any watch? They come in these wooden boxes like that, and they have ordnance markings on the back, like most of the military. And this is the uh, outer cardboard box that. So my grandpa told me the story about this. He said that he saw an ad in the Chicago Tribune for military surplus.
plus watches for sale. So they were going to be made a beeline for the place and I got there before they opened and knocked on the door and said, I'm here from the military surplus watches. We well, we have one left. And now I did it. 50 bucks. I said, I'll take it. <laughs> so on the outside of this box, he wrote down there, $500 mint. Well, it goes for a lot more than that. Uh, model 22. Another one that's pretty cool is the uh, elapsed time clock, I think it's called. And it has this complicated uh, dial on it which has uh, 24 hour time around the outside, seconds indication a dial, a date dial, uh, and it also has a stopwatch, and then it has an elapsed time uh, <coughs> dial which is at the bottom which uh, turns white or red. So my understanding is these would be in like in a cockpit of a plane, a modern cockpit. Uh, and I have a picture, I think, of like that. <laughs> Maybe it'd be a standard cockpit here where it shows one of those watches or uh, clocks, I should say, uh, mounted in there along with the other instrumentations. And uh, these are made by uh, Elgin and Hamilton. So I think the two companies combined make different parts. Some made the case parts, some made the hands, some made the wheels, and then they interchange them, supply each other with it. So some of these will be marked Elgin, some will be marked Hamilton. Uh, <coughs> I, uh, I bought one, the one I have at, at, at uh, the uh, Chapter 121 auction in Vancouver a couple years ago. For, I had a spirited bidding I got up to 325 bucks, and I, I won it. But I thought, that was, I thought, oh my gosh, I probably I spent too much, but it turned out to go for about twice that on eBay, so that's uh, pretty good, considering it's working. I'm not going to tackle this one either in terms of trying to fix it. If it needs a, needs a cleaning, that's beyond my skills as a watchmaker. I admire anybody who can do that. But uh, it has uh, an eight day movement. And this is the, the back, has, uh, this one is our Hamilton Watch Company. And some of them is the second Elgin on there. And uh, yeah, so another one. It's not a watch, but it's made by Hamilton as a map measure. I happen to have one of these over there if you want to play with it. It's uh, used to trace. My understanding is they, because the maps in, uh, back then were, it was highly accurate, but not all the roads are straight, so if you want to figure out how long it's going to take you to get from point A to point B, you didn't have Google Maps to go in and say, or GPS. You had to take this little duel and trace along the map, and then it would convert how many inches. <laughs> Tell you how many inches you ran along the map, and then you use the map code to figure out, or the key to figure out how many miles it would be. Or it has an inner dial sensor, so you can use either one. So uh, it's a pretty cool little uh, device for World War II, and a lot of them made. I, not too many of them, you don't see too many of them. Made by Hamilton. Uh, so I think that's it for all the pocket watches and things. Uh, another one I was highlight of it is uh, Hamilton Hall 21, where we're doing on time, so we got about five or ten more minutes. Seems like most people are still awake, so that's good. Uh, that Hamilton Hall 21 is 85 size, um, which is a huge dial, and it's a 14 joule movement, and it's a bit retro, and it has a fusée and uh, a helical hairspray, um, but not too many were made, like less than 10,000. This one has a 2E serial number. So if you see these, they're hard to not notice that it's a Hamilton 21 because they're huge. But it, uh, they have two E serial numbers and they have a 12 hour dial and they have a wine indicator on there. These are key wine watches and key set. So they, these are uh, um, mounted, usually all of them are mounted in gimbals and, and usually they have two boxes. And if you do research you'll find, oh, I've, I've, got, every, I've got my Model 21. Oh, wait a minute, there's more. There's a Model 121. And there's a Model 221 that are even rarer. Those are not very many made. One of them has a black 24-hour dial, and the other one has a four-orbit dial. So those are on my wish list. But I, I thought one of the 221 sold at Christie's about five years ago for like 13,000 bucks. So probably not going to be uh, anytime soon that I get one of those. But the, these watches uh, have the, the two boxes, and they're highly uh, important when you're navigating in the ocean. My understanding was that they sometimes had more than one of these, maybe three of them, because if you lost your time, you lost your place, and you could crash, or you could not be at the, at the uh, right point in the, in the, uh, in the 
assault at the time you're supposed to be there. So uh, with the, these watches are highly, highly accurate. Probably these clocks were it's probably one of the most accurate timepieces ever made. And there's a lot of things that went to them. And weren't you telling me that uh, if you abandoned ship, you got the chronometer out of the... from uh, Whitney's book. The, the quote here is, uh, this is one of the greatest achievements in the history of horology was the performance of the ring parameter balance hairspring assembly. So it says the uh, yeah. yeah, these were uh, not only a notable human achievement, but a technical triumph. So this is from a guy who, this is all he did, was work on the parameter and military watches. So it's high praise. Some of the things that made them so accurate were it had, like I said, a fusee uh, uh, ring with the mainspring that's a fusee, right? Uh -huh. So it keeps a constant torque on, the, on the, that chain, uh, no matter what, how, how much the mainspring barrel has, uh, has gone down. It had a solid, solid balance wheel, and it had the Eleanor Extra helical hairspring, which I have a picture of in a little while, I'll show you. And then uh, they did detente, which is something I'll, I'll explain in a second here. And then, uh, made it easy to adjust, with, uh, they, they made it precisely for, uh, for people who needed to adjust them, like Marvin, Marvin Whitney, so they could make precise adjustments with the timing weights. So the, this is an article that was out, I think, a year ago in the bulletin. Uh, the man who saved the Hamilton Miles one of the ship's chronometer, his name was V.E. Van Hosen. Yeah, I think that's how he pronounced his name, but he was a, a jeweler, and uh, this is in Memphis. And basically, he was one of the, maybe it says in the article, maybe one of the dozen people in the U.S. capable of making the detente uh, to the tolerance that needed to make this chronometer to work. Uh, the, this is a severely blown up picture. This number five right here is, is the is the detente. So this uh, allows the balance wheel to pass and not have any friction, essentially. And, and you see all the, whoops, uh, sorry. See all the. This is a blown-up version of, of that that piece. So he was able to convert his jewelry store into a little mini factory, making these parts, which are like a quarter-inch long whole thing. And uh, so he was able to give them a, a large enough supply to keep these the, those 10,000 chronometers uh, on track for the U.S. Navy and whatever. So you know, you start digging out, you find one guy. You know, if he didn't step up, maybe somebody else would have. But it could have turned the tide in the war. You know, that's kind of. Uh, Interesting facts about these uh, these watches. There's him building his parts and using a microscope to be able to see that precise. So pretty cool. Um, I'll show you some pictures if, if this works of the one I bought. So there's the uh, all the helical hairspring. This has got a large balance wheel. It's probably over an inch in diameter. And you see the timing weights are on the outside. Uh, let's see if I can get this to work and show some more pictures here. Uh, let's see. It comes, uh, when I bought it, it came in this, uh, this is a shipping tub. It's uh, like an aluminum shipping tub with foam insert. When I bought it, it had, the movement was packed in there. You take it out of the gimbals and then the boxes, and the uh, gimbals were in another box. So because of that, uh, UPS charged 300 bucks for one box and 300 bucks for the other box. It's like, Cost me 600 bucks to have it shipped to Vancouver. Uh, I'm just going to rifle through here. One of the nice things about the one I bought, which is not necessarily the case, is it has the outer box and the, the inside box, the dial, the movement, all have the same serial number, which I'm told is pretty rare because uh, one of these came back and got swapped, you know, whatever was around. Um, there's the dial. There's the one indicator right up here. There's the serial number. And uh, there's a bit of the chain and the fuse and there's the gimbals. So that's the inner box, and there's the shipping tub, and there's the outer box serial number. So yeah, and, and of course it comes comes with a book to tell you precisely not how to screw it up. <laughs> this is such a precision instrument, somebody like me 
has to be very careful that they don't screw it up. Um, there's where you wind it up right there. And this piece right here is a locking mechanism for the balance wheel. It's these two arms that are come around, you can see on either side of the balance wheel, that uh, just gently touch it so when you're shipping this thing, you can lock down the balance wheel so it doesn't, doesn't get broken. And uh, yeah, that's what it looks like. Then you take it out of the tub. So. Okay. give you guys some uh, some references like I said at various online sources so just so much things on the internet now uh, a lot of bulletins I, I inherited a stack of them I buy them whenever I can and usually get them for free uh, in fact all the bulletins are now online uh, so you can go, go back all the way to the 1940s and they're all scanned and a couple of good books uh, Time for America which was written in 1990s the 100 year anniversary of Hamilton and that book there the military watches by military time that's it. Any questions?